electricity, air, and fuel. And the fuel and ignition system get them together somehow. That's the idea. But let me show you. Let's start with just how the ignition system uses electricity. The ignition switch turns current on or off when you start or stop the engine. The electricity is first provided by the battery. So where does the electrical current go next? To the starter motor. After it gives the engine a few turns, the ignition system will take over to keep the engine running. And to do that, the electric current flows to the ignition coil to increase the voltage. The distributor sends that high voltage current to each spark plug. Yeah, I see them. Older cars have breaker point distributors, lots of little moving parts inside that eventually wear out. Today's cars use electronics to do the job, with fewer moving parts. Yeah, I've heard of that. Uh, it's called electronic ignition. Right. In each spark plug, the high voltage current jumps across a tiny gap on the end of the plugs. This spark ignites the air and fuel mixture already in the combustion chamber. Well, where did that air and fuel mixture come from? Well, let's first take a look at how fuel gets to the combustion chamber. There's a car. It shows the approximate layout of the fuel system components. Below the car, you can see the function of each component. So now the fuel travels along those, um... Fuel lines. Yes, the fuel is moved through the lines by the action of the fuel pump. So now the fuel is pumped right into the engine? Not yet, George. First, the fuel has to pass through the fuel filter. It removes any contaminants in the fuel. Well, we got the fuel this far, but what about the air? You said earlier I needed an air and fuel mixture. That's right. Let's go. You know, I'll never get used to traveling like that. But you, uh, you never answered my question, remember? Yes, you wanted to know where the air came from in the air and fuel mixture. Well, George, the engine pulls air in through the air filter. It removes any contaminants in the air as it's pulled in. The clean air is then mixed with a small amount of fuel provided by the fuel system. Yeah, but what mixes the air and fuel? Well, there are two ways to do that. Older cars have a carburetor, but most of today's cars use a fuel injection system. How does the carburetor work? Well, a carburetor is a complicated device, but basically it's designed to mechanically adjust the proper proportion of air and fuel so the engine can go faster or slower as needed. So then when I press on the accelerator, I'm actually controlling how the carburetor mixes the air and fuel. Only if your car has a carburetor. Today's cars usually don't have them. That's what you said. So then instead of a carburetor, today's cars use... Fuel injection. That's right. In cars with fuel injectors, there's no carburetor. Right. Instead, the fuel is squirted into the combustion chamber and mixed with the air. Injectors work something like this. Oh. So the air and fuel is mixed in a nice spray. Yes, in today's cars, electronics are used to control the fuel injectors so the amount of air and fuel will be just right. You know, there's so many electronics in cars these days. True, and we'll see even more in the years ahead. Come on this way. So now, the air and fuel mixture gets to the combustion chamber. That's where it will be ignited by the spark. Whoa! So that's ignition. What about all that smoke? Well, that's what's left over after combustion. The exhaust system takes care of it. Exhaust emission controls remove certain harmful gases to reduce air pollution. Yeah, that's important. But you know, the ignition and fuel system isn't so complicated after all. Everything seems to work together so smoothly. And to keep it running that way, the system should be checked periodically by a professional service technician. Isn't there anything I can do myself? Well, George, you can change the air filter when it gets dirty. But as you saw, there are many parts to the system that should be handled by a qualified professional. Can you tell me what's involved when I take my car in for ignition and fuel system servicing? Well, sure. Using computerized test instruments, the technician analyzes the ignition and fuel system's performance. This versatile equipment tests and checks all these things. The charging and starting systems, ignition coil, wiring and current distribution, spark plug output, and the fuel control system. The technician also checks and adjusts the timing. Whoa, timing. What's that? It's an adjustment to control the exact time the spark occurs in the combustion chamber. The service technician also checks the distributor cap for cracks and burn contacts and the electronic sensors for proper operation. The carburetor is checked for proper operation of mechanical linkages. If the engine has fuel injection, the service technician checks the system's electronic injectors and fuel delivery system. 
the engine idle speed is adjusted as necessary. Air and fuel filters are inspected and replaced if dirty or clogged. As you've seen, George, there's a lot involved in the ignition and fuel system. Professional service will help keep your engine running reliably and efficiently. Yeah, I see your point. Pick another dimension, George. Cooling. Okay. The cooling system's basic job is to control the heat created by the engine as it runs. Warm enough for efficient operation, but without overheating. That sounds pretty tricky to me. I know an engine can get really hot after a lot of driving. Well, every engine has a proper operating temperature. The cooling system maintains that temperature. Let's take a closer look. Okay. There's the radiator. Oh, one really big radiator. The radiator is part of the cooling system. It's what's inside the radiator that's important, too. That's coolant. It's simply a mixture of two different liquids, like this, water and antifreeze. Mix the two, and you've got coolant. Well, why is coolant so special? Because coolant can absorb heat better than ordinary water. The coolant absorbs heat as it circulates through a network of passages in the engine. Absorbs engine heat. OK. But the radiator's over there. And the engine's over there. So how does the coolant circulate? Well, that's the job of the rest of the cooling system. Let me show you how it all works. The coolant absorbs the heat from the engine and lowers the engine's temperature. But doesn't the coolant get too hot to keep the engine at the right operating temperature? Yes, but fortunately, the system is designed to take care of the hot coolant. See the thermostat? It has a preset operating temperature. When the coolant exceeds that temperature, the thermostat opens and the coolant can flow through it. Well, what makes it flow? That's the job of the water pump. It's operated by a belt connected to the engine. The pump moves the coolant along and keeps it circulating. So when the hot coolant is flowing through all those tubes inside the radiator, it's cooled by the air drawn in by the fan. An engine-driven belt runs the fan. In some engines, the fan is operated by an electric motor. In either case, when the engine is running, the fan pulls in air. The same coolant flows around and around from the engine to the radiator and back to the engine again. Simple. But there's coolant in there, too. Yes, that's the coolant recovery tank. It's used to prevent uh, coolant from being lost and to help keep the system pressurized. As your engine runs, coolant in the radiator expands and pressure increases. Instead of being forced out of the system, some coolant flows into the recovery tank. Then, when the engine stops, heat and pressure in the radiator are reduced. So coolant is siphoned right back into the radiator. So that's why the recovery tank has two coolant level marks on it, uh, hot and cold. It's like a circle. First the coolant gets hot from the engine's heat, then cooled down, then heated again, then cooled again. Yes, so you can see why it's important for the coolant to circulate freely. Well, what happens if it stops flowing? Trouble. If the coolant stops flowing or freezes in winter, the engine heat will convert some coolant to steam. The steam forces its way out of the radiator through the pressure cap. This means lost coolant. With less coolant circulating, the engine quickly overheats, and that can lead to problems for you. Hey, what's going on? A warning light. Any problem with a cooling system is usually signaled by a warning light or a temperature gauge. If the warning light does not go off, pull over and park just as soon as you can do so safely. Then should I open the hood and let the air cool the engine? Don't open the hood if you see or hear steam or hot coolant escaping from the engine compartment. Wait until neither one can be seen or heard. Another safety point. Never take either the radiator cap or recovery tank cap off while the engine and radiator are still hot. Scalding liquid and steam can be blown out under pressure if either cap is removed. Well, thanks for the warning. Overheating is serious stuff. But uh, obviously, in the winter, I want heat in my car. Is the heater connected to the cooling system, too? Good question, George. When you turn on the heater, some of the hot coolant is diverted from the radiator and flows to the network of heater core tubes. This warms the air around the heater core. As this happens, a blower moves the warmed air into the passenger compartment. Well, now that I know how important the cooling system is, I want to keep it running properly. So 